you. Uh, okay. Um, I, am, I am very pleased uh, to introduce uh, Pedro Lopez Barra. He is professor of ancient, uh, of ancient history at the University of Santiago de Compostela in Spain. His research fields include, among others, the ancient political thought, the romanization of the Western Mediterranean from the late Republic to the early empire, the social relations between masters and slaves, and the provincial elites, and last but, last but not least, Latin epigraphy with specific attention to juridical texts. He has published many important works on all these topics. Here, I would like just to remember his studies on the age of Sallust, which I have much appreciated, on Aristoteles, on the political attitude of Cicero, and of course, on the patterns of the civil wars during the late Republic. He is going to publish an impressive book on Caesar's civil wars, whose title is Entre Tyrannos, La Guerra Civil de Caesar. Sorry for my pronunciation. And also today's presentation on the Bellum Civile Pompeianum is part of it, this wide research topic, which is still a work in progress. And of course, it is particularly welcome here. So Pedro, I give you the floor, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank you, Professor Santangelo and Professor Balbo for having organized this very stimulating uh, seminar. I, it began as an experiment. I have uh, seen uh, some of the uh, recording, in particular the, the first one, which was very nice for this uh, uh, well, it was like the, the beginning. No, I, apparently you didn't know very well how it was going to, to come out at, at, at the end of the, of the day. And, and it, it has been a, a, a great success. No? I, and I hope that my talk today will not be too disappointing in this uh, list of uh, extraordinary lectures. I will speak in English. I, I apologize from the beginning because my uh, my accent, my pronunciation is not good. My English is not, uh, it, it is neither. Uh, uh, but I think that uh, it will be uh, my it will be um, better. It will be more easily followed by more people if I speak in English than if I do it in Spanish. It is a pity that Spanish is not a very commonly used language in classics, perhaps maybe because of decisions just like this one by me, but uh, well, that's the, the reality. It's easier for everybody uh, to share and discuss and dialogue in, in English than in uh, Spanish or other languages. Uh, as uh, Mattia Balbo has just said, uh, my research has uh, now is uh, um, producing this book uh, between tyrants and tyrannos uh, on the uh, Caesar civil war, and I think that the the book will be published maybe in three or four uh, months time. Uh, I will give now an overview. I, when I was um, I was uh, thinking about the topic of this uh, talk uh, at the beginning. I I thought I should focused on one aspect of the research, but I, I uh, then I decided uh, eventually to give more an overview of the argument. This may feel sometimes a little bit uh, too light, no, or a light touch in the in the talk, uh, not uh, not going too deep into uh, some aspects. But I think uh, it would be uh, it would give a more precise idea of what I try to convey. So I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, this is this is okay. I think you are, you can see that now. You can see the, the okay okay. We do see we do see yes thank you okay. thank you. Well, in the beginning were the sources. <clears throat> My first uh, contention is that if we take a look at the state of the field on the subject, there is probably a well-established consensus about what source is most important and reliable in order to reconstruct the Civil War period, Asinius Polio. Uh, Okay. 
a man who had first-hand experience of the war, who participated in some of the military expeditions, in particular the African disaster of Curio, who witnessed, who witnessed some of the most famous moments of the war, such as the crossing of the Rubico River or the Basel at Farsalus. His Antonian loyalty is out of question and gave him the consulship of the year 40 B before Christ BC and a chair at the conference of Brundisium when Mark and Anthony were trying to come to terms and, and reach an agreement. Most important for us, after Sal's death in 35 or 34 BC, Polio started writing his own histories whose chronological frame is uncertain. Most scholars would probably admit that Polio started with the formation of the so-called First Triumvirate in 60 BC and continued to the Battle of Philippi in 42 or perhaps later covering uh, the Battle of Actium. His reputation as source, and this is what is important for me today, is among the greatest. Signed explicitly set out to write the Roman Revolution on that solid foundation. And this is a quote, Polio was a pessimistic Republican and an honest man. His example may encourage the attempt to record the story of the Roman Revolution and its sequel, the Principate of Caesar, Augustus, in a fashion that has now become unconventional from the Republican and Antonian side. This is his point of departure, you know, the Senius Polio and the Antonian uh, side, so to speak. Uh, <clears throat> Later, he says, uh, Sign, a scholar, a wit, and an honest man, a friend of Caesar and of Antonius, but a Republican. The pessimistic and clear sighted Republican felt no confidence in a cause championed by Cicero, the pomp and insincerity of whose oratory he found so distasteful. It is clear that, in a sense, Sign found some kind of uh, twin soul in Asinius Polio, some kind of uh, uh, affinity between the image that uh, Sim made of Asinius and his own view of the uh, late uh, Republic. And he uh, had great confidence no, in uh, Polio as a source. And I think that this confidence uh, Brandt somehow inherited. No? Uh, when, for example, this is just an example, uh, talking about the casualties at Farsalus in his Italian manpower, when he has to choose, Brandt has to choose between Caesar's and Polius, he preferred Polius estimates no, to Caesar's. No? And uh, he uh, mentioned, no, he uh, says that Polio was uh, cautious, no? was, uh, a man who somehow uh, was uh, more reliable than even uh, Caesar, no? in, uh, at least in this particular uh, topic. Yet, as it is well known, we don't have uh, Polio's histories. We should concern ourselves with the Greek version in Appian Civil War books or Plutarch, for that effect, which um, they, uh, uh, the conventional uh, opinion goes, uh, Appian and Plutarch had used Polio's histories as their main source. This is, well, uh, we don't have, we don't need to uh, much, um, much erudition, much scholarship about this. Uh, probably the best known book uh, is Gabas, A Piano la Storia delle Guerre Civile. Uh, the, main book, the main source is Polio. The same in this uh, brief, a very good article by Gelfer on the dry, the three letters by Asinius uh, Polio to, to Cicero. And Appian is uh, subtract, no? is the, the, funda the foundation no? of the um, uh, Asinius Polio is the foundation of Appian's uh, book on the civil war. And well, uh, there are obviously enough that have been doubts, for example, Drummond in, in the uh, Cornell's about the, the fragments of the Roman historians, no? not neither Plutarch nor Appian are the only source of, uh, have used uh, polio as their only source. But this is not the problem for me. The problem is that at most, even accepting that uh, polio was the main source for Plutarch uh, Appian, we only have an Greek, a Greek paraphrase in the best of the 
in the best case scenario. Hmm? Uh, this is not so important if words do not matter very much, if they are just flapdoodle, which is a word that I, I love. This was the case with Syme, paradoxically. Uh, Syme, uh, a man for whom style abides, as Fergus Miller famously said, uh, and yet for him, for Syme, words were propaganda, something that he can very elegantly dismiss, saying that they were uh, high sounding words. No? Uh, freedom, republic, well, this is just uh, flapdoodle, propaganda, choose the, the, the word that you want, nothing uh, to be taken too serious. No? Something that I would say is the <laughs> this pomp and insincerity uh, of uh, Cicero's oratory, which Polio, for certain, found the stateful, and I think that sign also. Hmm? Having said this, I want to suggest a change of, respect, of perspective. I want to go back to uh, Cicero, particularly much more than, than, sign, than Caesar. Uh, well, this is a, a painting by a not very famous Russian scholar, or at least not very famous, not to me, no? which is Pavel Zdenovsky, uh, with it portrays Fulvia with the uh, head of Cicero, with his tongue uh, pierced by two two needles, no? and well, it is uh, uh, an example no, of this um, late nineteenth century uh, painting. Okay, uh, Cicero as a as a source. Um, at least for today, Cicero will be our prin principal guide. According to Cornelius Nepos, his 16 books uh, of letters to Atticus are almost an equivalent to a proper historian. No? There are 16 books of letters. This is in the small fragments of the um, biography of Atticus by Cornelius Nepos. There are 16 books of letters written to Atticus which extend from his consulship to his latter days and which he that, read, that reads will not much require a regular history of those times. For all particulars concerning the inclinations of leading men, the faults of the generals and the revolutions in the government, this is the mutationes rei publicae, are so fully stated. But the, the main point for me is, is this quae qui legat, no? so he who reads, non multum desideret historiam contextam eorum temporum. We have the, the history just by reading, eh? Uh, the 16 books of letters to Atticus. Well, I would not take Nepos' testimony at face value, but I do believe that Cicero's letters are of invaluable help if one wants to recover the experience of civil war, as we are trying to do in this talk. With this objective in mind, I'm going to emphasize three aspects. Fear of this experience of the civil war. Fear memories and the ideological battle, the war of wars. Fear. <clears throat> okay, I want to start with the most obvious and important element in a civil war, violence. It is very revealing of the bias of modern scholarship that, to my knowledge, there have been very few attempts at estimating the number of casualties in the civil war. We should look at it in vain in the splendid pages written by Luc de Ligt uh, on peasant citizens and soldiers, uh, studies in the demographic history of Roman Italy of 2012. Obviously enough, casualties at each of the main battles in these wars have been extensively debated but the demographic impact of war goes well beyond battles. Starvation, diseases, revenges, killings, the brutal ransack of cities, among other factors, all this surely caused a high number of deaths, both among the civilians and the military. It simply defies credibility to think that a 20 year civil war would not have taken a severe toll on Roman population, but as yet, as yet no one has cared to ask, at least I insist to my knowledge. Although I have made some research in this topic, I would like to 
focus on other aspects in this talk, so I'm not going to enter in this subject any further, except by commenting briefly on the new kind of evidence provided in recent years by archaeology. Through osteological anal analysis, anthropologists have been able to reconstruct the gruesome circumstances surrounding the killings of defeated populations in two Spanish cities during the Sertorian War, Valencia and Libisosa. This is the uh, uh, Valencia and the excavations in 1987 and 2002. Uh, I have been discussing this uh, case with um, anthropologists, a physical anthropologist uh, here, a colleague in the University of, of Santiago. She's skeptic about the reconstructions given. Uh, perhaps uh, she thinks that the archaeologists have uh, jumped too uh, fast into conclusions. Uh, well, in any case, the, the conclusions by the uh, archaeologists is that uh, this was a, a staged execution. The, this was the, a public execution, 17 skeletons with evidence of having been tortured to death in the forum. Yeah? They were, well, the, the, their legs were cut and their head, and the, the head was then uh, laid in between the, their legs. Well, um, there, there is some, uh, at least, uh, some uh, evidence that uh, this could have uh, have happened. We have here the, the, the fragment from Pompey's letter to the Senate when he is uh, informing the Senate that the Urs Valencia, the city of Valencia, have, has been uh, completely um, destroyed, as we know by the uh, physical evidence from the. Uh, archaeological uh, excavations. The second is uh, Libisosa in Albacete, where uh, we have, uh, in this case, is a child, cannot be uh, determined with any, um, uh, through a archaeological, through, sorry, through anthropological uh, studies cannot be determined if it was a, a girl or a boy, probably a girl because of the, there were some uh, things attached to to the skeleton that made the uh, excavators think that it was a girl. In any case, uh, she was uh, killed by a blow on her uh, uh, on the right side of her of her head, probably during the turmoil uh, when the the city was uh, was taken. The important point for me is that neither the Valencia nor the Bibi Sosa case were. Uh, that was not killing in battle. It was uh, they were not killing the battlefield. Huh? Uh, this is uh, the this um, it is we all know that, but we have this very vivid uh, evidence with these uh, pictures and the uh, analysis from the uh, anthropologists that uh, before our, um, our very eyes we can see that this is not. Uh, that there are many other uh, things that uh, of violence that surrounds the uh, the battlefield and the, the casualties in the in the battlefield. Maybe one reason for this lack of interest for the suffering of the common people during the civil wars may lay in the many details we happen to know about the lives and deaths of the aristocracy. Uh, this is uh, based upon the mm, well-known book by Bruns and Caesar and the over 60, the upper class uh, in, this, uh, in these years. And uh, as we can see, uh, as is well known, all the uh, Pompeian consulares uh, in 49 BC were killed uh, in 44 BC, except Caius Claudius Marcellus and uh, Cicero uh, himself. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I will say that this, I mean, death was not the only things aristocrats care about. In his book on the logic of violence, Statis Calibas showed that when choosing sides, Personal connections are even more important than obvious candidates such as fear, ideas, or hate. Your friends, your family, your people, it is their opinion which matters most. Your reputation sets clear limits to the options you have when taking sides. 
this is the probably the the conclusion that is most important for us from from this uh, this book. Obviously, he doesn't. Uh, I mean, Calibas do not uh, take uh, does not take uh, ancient evidence into account. His main evidence is from the Greek civil war uh, in the twentieth century, but. Uh, it is um, interesting to, to see that up to a point, some of uh, his conclusions are also um, or can also be taken to uh, the ancient evidence. And well, some reflection upon this one will be uh, made uh, later. To illustrate this point, I have chosen three examples from Ciceronian letters. No? The idea of the, the, the importance of these personal connections, no? even more important than fear uh, or, um, or ideas, no? or the ideological uh, standing. No? The three examples from Ciceronian letters following the Cornelius Nepos um, uh, inspiring uh, sentence uh, are Marcus Callius Rufus in 50 BC, Cicero one year later, and Polio himself in 43, when he was looking in retrospect to his conduct under Caesar's command. All three confronted the very delicate issue of having to negotiate their way between personal connections and ideological standing. Marcus Caelius Rufus had been an active supporter of Milo during the difficult months in the aftermath of Claudius' assassination. And yet now, in uh, 50, September of 50 BC, he uh, says, I am bound to these men by ties of gratitude and intimacy while I love the opposite cause whose defenders I hate. Well, I should pause here for uh, a minute. I haven't been able to get the uh, Shackleton Bailey's translation of uh, Cicero's letters uh, to friends. I have the old uh, Lord Classical Library translation, and I don't like very much in this uh, particular uh, paragraph. So the translation is perhaps not very accurate, but the idea is uh, it's very clear. No? Uh, uh, Caelius is saying that uh, he loves the Pompeian cause, but uh, I, uh, he hates the men uh, on this side uh, of, the, of the board, so to speak. And uh, so he's going to choose not the cause, but the, the men, no? not the, the arma, but the birum, if we want to play with the Virgilian uh, tropo. Uh, okay, so uh, he has been an, a, def, a defender, no? he has been a follower of the uh, Optimates cause in 52, when uh, the uh, Milo's uh, case uh, for the assassination of Claudius, but now he will follow Caesar. And in fact, that's what he did no? in January 49 with Mark Antony and Curio. He left behind his loyalties to the Optimates and he follow the path that kept him in the company of his friends and far from his enemies. The second example is uh, Cicero. This is uh, a letter to Atticus uh, in March 49 uh, BC. What tortures me and has all along is the question of duty. To stay in Italy is certainly the more prudent course to go overseas to Pompeii is thought the more honorable. Sometimes I feel as though I had rather be thought to have acted imprudently by many than dishonorably by a few. Well, it's obviously in March, uh, he's not thinking of going to uh, Pompeii uh, overseas, no, because Pompeii is still in Italy, but his idea is that uh, the idea of uh, that everybody no, is going uh, overseas no? uh, sooner or later. So uh, his dilemma no, is uh, safety mm, mm, or uh, this pauki, eh, these people eh, uh, whose, um, whose opinion Cicero 
things are most important no? to him. No? What do these people think about him is uh, paramount. This is his honor. And without this honor, without this, uh, this existimatio, what his peers think about his conduct, that, that would be, he would be lost. He would be tantamount to, to be dead. Oh, in, a, in a sense, no? he even puts this uh, honor uh, before uh, safety in this case. Polio. Well, I think that polio sits extremely well in Caliba's work, in Caliba's theories. Caliba's pointed out that ideological explanations tend to be paramount only in retrospect. Once the war is over, then appears the need to explain one's conduct in ideological terms. Then it is an urgent matter. Uh, the letter is um, splendid. And as I said before, Gelser analysis of it is worth reading even today. And uh, the, the paragraph uh, that uh, is most interesting for us today is this one. He says, what it is what it was possible for me to achieve on my own initiative, I perform in such a way as to win the heartiest approval of every true patriot. This is Optimus Quisque. This is not a very good <laughs> translation, in my opinion. What I did under orders, I did at such moment and in such a manner as to make it evident that instructions had been issued to an unwilling act, to an unwilling agent. The key words are in red. You see. Enemies, inimicos, dilexi, no, I, the, the people I love, no, uh, in this case is Caesar, no, he's saying I follow Caesar because I love him, hmm? and uh, but I was also at heart, uh, even in a disguised way, you know, I was uh, an, an optimus, I was one of the optimates, uh, uh, even if I had to do uh, things that I didn't want to do, you no, know, this. Uh, just following order. No? This, uh, this is an excuse uh, that is as good, uh, it was as good then as it is now. But uh, Polio lays the emphasis, the emphasis on what certain people may think about his doing. No? Ut optimus quisque maxime provari. No? Uh, I, I want to win the heartiest approval of every two patient. No? So we have here the two things going together, no? the ideological standing, but also uh, the, the personal uh, connections. Mm? Uh, in this case, is Caesar. No, I, I love Caesar. I know, sorry, Caesar loved me. OK, this is uh, about fear and the fear not only to to death, uh, to, but also to lose your personal connections, your, your social standing as an aristocrat among your peers. The second point is memories. There have been, a, there have been many works on, in recent years showing how important social memories were in the last decade, decades of the Roman Republic. Scholars have pointed out that there were conflicting memories will be popularists against optimates or aristocrats against plebeian. This is a debated point uh, even today. Uh, some uh, authors, uh, some scholars are here uh, listed. I'm not, I cannot I, uh, really enter too deep into this uh, point, but it is quite clear in my opinion that there was not uniformity in this. Roman novels were not unanimous in the way they portrayed the Roman past. Uh, and now I want, I, I would like to add just the Cicero's touch, so to speak, on two different topics. First, the statues, and then what I call the cast of characters. I, we will see later what I mean by that. The statues. The statues have always been a very contentious issue, and we all have watched very recently the hot debates taking place in the USA about the statues of heroes of the past being accused of racism, racism. At the beginning of the last book of his dialogue on the Republic, 
Cicero makes Laelius complain that no statues have been erected to Nasica, to Nasica for killing Tiberius Gracchus. This part is lost. Uh, we only have uh, the summary by Macrobius in Scipio's dream. Uh, he uh, says, uh, as an introduction, no, uh, Laelius complains no statues have been erected to uh, Nasica for killing Tiberius Gracchus. And then uh, this discussion about what is true glory. And then Scipio uh, tells uh, about his, his uh, dream. Uh, the point is that uh, in 52, so when Cicero was writing this dialogue, there was an, a question statue of Scipio Nasica commissioned by his great grandson, Metellus Scipio, on the Capitol Hill near the Temple of Ops. The portrait was not accurate and Scipio was severely criticized by um, uh, Cicero in a letter to Atticus for having got all, all wrong about his ancestors, but this is not our concern now. For better or for worse, both a statue of Tiberius Gracchus, according to Plutarch, and a statue of his killer stood on the Capitol Hill very close to one another. There was also a third one worth mentioning. Uh, this is what? Uh, worth mentioning in this context, it, it stood also on the Capitol Hill, but near the Temple of Fides in the Area Capitolina, in front of the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, and represented the famous tyrant slayers Armodius and Aristogaiton. Arist I don't know how to pronounce this in, in English. The statue of Armodius is uh, lost, but we have Aristogaiton, uh, even if badly uh, damaged. Pinapolo has suggested very interestingly that the commissioner may have been Marcus Aemilius Scaurus, an staunch optimate, in connection with the restoration of the Temple of Fides in 115-106, that is when the anti-Gracan reaction was at its prime. I am aware that there have been other proposals very recently. Uh, for example, uh, it has been claimed that the date, the statue is of Augustan uh, date. In any case, on the Capitol Hill, as I, I have just said, the visitor could see both the statue of the great popularist hero, Tiberius Gracchus, and of his slayer, um, Nasica, two memories mutually confronted in the very center of Rome. My second point is what I have uh, said before, the cast of characters. Some of the people Cicero chooses for his dialogues are prominent optimates who were killed by violent popularis. In the Oratore, in 50, uh, 55 BC, apart from Crassus, who died before the civil war erupted, three of the participants faced terrible deaths in the hands of the Sina's supporters, of Sina's supporters. Marcus Antonius was killed by the tribune Publius Annius and his head taken to the great Caius Marius. Caesar's trouble was turned in by a friend of the Marianists and Catullus case was a little bit more complicated. Gratidianus as tribune of the plebs pressed Charles against him. Marius against refused to help him. So Catullus committed suicide preempting conviction. Cicero employed a similar tactic several years later in 45 BC when he wrote his dialogue on the Finibus. Both Marcus Port Porcius Cato and Lucius Manlius Torquatus committed suicide after Tapsus, while Caius Valerius Triarius fought for Pompey and appears to have died at Pharsalus or very uh, soon afterwards. In this way, Cicero preserved the memories of the martyrs among the optimates, those who had fallen in the civil conflicts against Marius first and then against Caesar. So fear, memories, and now the, the war of words, no? the high sounding words in time uh, phrase. Cicero, as we know, spent several agonizing months deciding which side he would support and whether he should join those who had abandoned Italy or not. When he finally chose Pompeii, after a feverish night of sleeplessness and vomiting, 
he sent a short note to his wife stating, this is the, the, the letter, that he had committed himself to defending the Republic together with those men he considered closest to him in political matters. His decision was based upon ideals and connections. In this case, both coincide in Pompey's camp. Hmm? Uh, he says uh, that he was feeling unwell, and then he, he found a reason. Uh, this was undiluted bile. I got rid of, of it all that night. Uh, he had been six months uh, writing to articles almost every every night and uh, and almost every every day. And now he has um, made up his mind and uh, says, I, I hope that someday I shall have men like myself at my side to defend, to defend the, the Republic. On the presumed ideological monotony, a lot has been said. In my opinion, as it takes two to tango, it also takes two to fight a civil war. Monotony is an unlikely word to describe the situation. There was a war of words. I have written on this in a recent issue of Classical Quarterly, so we can go faster here. Uh, the main point is that uh, there was a war of words. Pompey's, uh, Pompey's side uh, used as uh, their flag, uh, Republic, while Caesar's flag was uh, Libertas, Freedom. And very specifically, this uh, sentence that to me is uh, key, no? this populum plebem in libertatem vindicare, this sets uh, the people, uh, asserting the freedom of the people. No? In fact, I have suggested to see his commentaries on the civil war as a popularis manifesto. No? Uh, this uh, asserting the freedom of the people figures very conspicuously in Caesar's speech at Corfinium. No? This is the Se uh, et populum romanum factione pacorum oppressum in libertatem vindicare. It has a very specific meaning, as we know from Cicero in the in, in Cicero's book about the Republic uh, on the Republica. Uh, Scipio is explaining the different types of government when he comes to democracy or civitas popularis. He says. Uh, he uses no, this, this word, this is a, a, a slogan, a catchword of the populares, no? this uh, in libertatem rem populi uh, vindicari, no? this is the, the catchword for the, the, uh, for the populares, no? and this is uh, also the word or the, the, the phrase that Caesar is using when he's, uh, uh, he's uh, in front of the soldiers, of his soldiers, and also the defeated uh, soldiers at Corfinium, and he's explaining his motives for uh, having uh, invaded uh, Italy. Uh, so, uh, I, as I, I said, uh, this is the, the, mm, the catchwords of the Pompeian side, no? the Rem Publica, the Res Publica, the Rem Publica in Libertatem Vindicari, the asserting the freedom, but not of the the people, but of the of the republic, we have very many uh, instances of this uh, uh, of this sentence, all from the point of view, I would say, of the optimatis. While the other uh, phrase, this populum plebem libertatem vindicare, is uh, from the point of view of the uh, populares, no, or it's put in the mouth of uh, popularis uh, leaders, no, such as uh, Salus, no. Tiberius and Caius Gracchus, no? Vindicare Pleven in Libertate. Here we have uh, Cicero, and obviously enough, no? in the end, Res Gestae Divi Augusti, no? uh, with this uh, famous, uh, famous uh, opening. No? Okay, so, so far we have been dealing with the experiences of civil war, mainly through the lens of Cicero's writing. This was a subjective uh, approach. Now I want to move a step forward and try to understand the theoretical frame, the narrative into which these experiences were integrated. My opinion is that there were not two, but not one, but two narratives. The first one is what David Armitage, the Harvard historian 
uh, with in his book very what uh, debated and very influential uh, it has been translated also into into spanish the civil war a history in ideas this is what he called the roman paradigm which is the foundation no? the uh, Armitage claimed that the romans so invented the the idea of the civil war uh, he says uh, the Romans were the first to experience internal conflicts as civil war as they introduced two key concepts. First, that war took place within the boundaries of a single political community, and second, that there should be at least two contending parties in the civil war, one with a legitimate claim of authority over that community. In the Greek cases, however, he claims, questions of legitimacy did not arise. Well, this is one paradigm. The other paradigm is uh, Agamben, Giorgio uh, Agamben's uh, also very famous uh, political philosopher, uh, Italian, in his short book, Stasis. This is uh, 2015, so two years earlier than Armitage's. And uh, this uh, book about Stasis uh, has two parts, main, uh, that is uh, his concern is Hobbes in the second part, and uh, the first part of the book is about the Greek uh, case. In this uh, first part, uh, Agamben relies uh, heavy, heavily on Nicole Loro, La Guerre dans la Famille, or the, the Divide the City, no? la, la Cité divisée. Uh, the Greek idea of stasis as delineated by uh, Nicole Law. Um, when Armitage published uh, his book, there was some debate, no? uh, particularly uh, Karsten Lange uh, claimed that uh, as uh, in, the, in this uh, sentence that I have here quoted, our ev ancient evidence at times almost elides differences between the concepts of stasis and civil war, and then virtually uses them as synonyms. Uh, in, uh, essentially, uh, what Lange says is that uh, Armitage had forgotten no? the Greek uh, idea. Right? The Greek idea uh, that that is essentially Appian. No? Appian, uh, for example, this idea that uh, civil war of the period should be viewed as one continuous war, not a series of civil wars. No? So uh, the idea that uh, more or less the Appian's no, point of view, this is a continuous uh, stasis. No? This is what is important. No? This is, uh, for Moritzen, is meaningless. The idea of a almost permanent state of crisis lasting 100 years is, of course, meaningless. And well, this is more or less uh, very briefly uh, the, the debate. No? What I, I would say is that uh, these are two conflicting narratives, two conflicting paradigms, what I, I have called the agamben Loro, and then the, the other one, the second one, Armitage. The first one is the hidden, the, sorry, the Greek paradigm, no, the stasis or philia eh, uh, against the bellum civile or justum bellum. I would say that Salus sits comfortably in this uh, side of the picture. Hmm? This is stasis or enfilia, while Cicero uh, uh, is more the Armitage, uh, Armitage side of the of the of the ball. First, uh, why I, I would say that uh, in the Greek side of the board, the important thing is that the stasis is something permanent. In law view, eh, is something that it is always there in the polis, eh? even if it's always hidden. Hmm? Law uh, reconstructs in a, a kind of psychological. Uh, situation more or less similar to the one in uh, our brain where our conscious part repress some unconscious ideas no? and, and then these ideas are left in the unconscious and uh, appear or reappear uh, in a 
indirect way, no? so to speak. And this is what uh, Laurent would see about the, the, the stasis in, in the Greek police. No? It is always there, but it's, it is always in, in denial. They don't want to see it. Huh? And they do not speak about it in a clear and direct manner. Huh? Uh, while the, uh, the Armitage paradigm, the Bellum Civile is something is, is an exception. It's something, even it's very frequent or can be very frequent. Huh? This is not a permanent state of the city. In Salust, uh, the, 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 the division is something that is, is always there from the very beginning. Huh? This is, a, a, for me, a very interesting uh, sentence uh, taken from the prologue of the Historias, huh? where he, uh, Salust says, the earliest conflicts arose among us as a result of a defect of human nature, which rested restlessly and without restraint, always engaged in a struggle for freedom or glory or power. This tricolon for me, it's very important because it functions in a dialectic way. Uh, power, dominatio, corresponds to uh, pauci or nobiles, while freedom, libertas, corresponds to the plebs. Uh, so, and they are confronting each, uh, each other. In Solust, so we have here this idea, this idea of anastasis, something which is permanent, which belongs in, in the city, which is something uh, that uh, it may disappear, huh? so to speak, only when there is an external threat. This is the metus hostilis, no? And then, okay, two parts of the city, they come together huh, to confront the uh, external uh, enemies. Not only that, uh, in the agamben loro paradigm, the uh, king is all important. It is a crime, it is a conflict between brothers. It is a, a fight, a war between brothers. And this is something that we can see also in Salust. Huh? Yeah, in Bellum Catilinae, it is time and again, the, the question is, is about uh, family. It's the, the father who kills his son because it's a Catilinarian, or it's in, in the very famous end when uh, Antonius or Petreius troop, troops are uh, uh, Victoria uh, have uh, defeated, uh, have beaten uh, Catilinus uh, troops. Then he says that the, they they can see in the uh, among the enemies, they, he can see that they were friends or hospites or or king. No, they were uh, brothers or or cousins. Uh, that they they it is not the question or the issue of citizenship. No? The, the main point is this uh, of uh, kin, mm. as a, a, a war in the, in, the, in the city. Okay. Um, and yet, in Cicero, we have the opposite. Huh? In Cicero, as you all know, we have time and again, res publica or patria over king and friends. You know? There are many uh, sentences that can be quoted. This is from the Ophicis, no? this republica, res publica or patria. No? Uh, parents are dear, dear are children, relatives, friends, but one native land embraces or all no, or, or, or lots. Uh, this is the, 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 main, the main idea, no? and this is also in the Philippics, the, um, if one has to choose between, for example, his son or the Respublica, there's no doubt, according to Cicero, he should kill his son huh? and defend his, uh, his patria. Not only that, uh, the, from uh, Cicero's point of view, uh, all citizens who have attacked the Republic have forfeited their citizenship by their own accord. 
This idea is crucial in Cicero's thinking and appears for the first time in the Paul's discourse against Catiline and then in some, uh, in some others. No? Uh, they are not entitled to provocatio because they are no longer Roman citizens, but public enemies. They are hostes, or in modern parlance, they are terrorists. The important thing is that in, um, in Sallust, we have hostis as a purely relational term. This word, hostis, that is so important in Cicero, huh? the idea that uh, Romans are fighting against internal enemies, which are not no longer citizens, they are hostes. Huh? And in Sallust, they, this is a purely relational term. Antonius' troops are hostes from Catiline's point of view. Hmm? Uh, so uh, this, uh, the, the questions of legitimacy, to use Armitage's uh, words, are not important in Sallust, uh, um, from Sallust's point of view. The important thing is that they are relatives, they are kin, yeah? they are uh, brothers. And um, so, the, in up to up to here, I think that the the two sides of the of the ball are quite clear. The third point is difficult for me. Uh, it's not uh, that easy to 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 be to get a clear picture in law uh, reconstruction. As I said, the stasis is always hidden in the Greek polis. Hmm? In Rome, it is not very clear, uh, as you all know, uh, Karsten Lange has argued that the triumph was not only uh, explicitly over enemies, foreign enemies, but it was also explicitly over uh, citizens. Uh, to cut a long story short, I would say that uh, Caesar clearly draw a line uh, between, drew a line uh, between Pharsalus and the rest. Uh, I mean, as, uh, as it is well known, uh, the Battle of Pharsalus was never officially uh, notified to the uh, Senate, not the laureate, laureate letters and all that. Uh, while the uh, war in Africa or in Spain was a, a war against uh, a foreign uh, prince, to which, in the African case, some uh, Romans have, uh, have um, devoted their lo loyalty. They have disgraced themselves, uh, the case of Scipio, when he um, uh, somehow uh, uh, bow to Juba's uh, authority, uh, or in the case of uh, Spani of Hispania, it was clear that uh, Pompeian uh, sons have had known had no uh, public authority. They were they have never been Roman magistrates, so they were privati. They were uh, uh, private citizens. So uh, I think that this was the reason why Caesar could. Uh, portray or could uh, triumph no? over um, these um, uh, enemies. And this is the reason why I have written here this unconceal. I don't know if the, the water, the, sorry, the word is the, the right one. In any case, I am not sure uh, whether uh, it is true that uh, this bellum uh, civile had to be repressed. In the sense as uh, Loro said in in the Greek uh, tragedy. So uh, in the end, as I said, uh, for Cicero, this distinction between citizen and or kibis uh, or kibes and hostes is all important. Eh? In the uh, uh, Catilinarias, uh, we have here this uh, idea that. Uh, we are uh, conducting a war, a, a just war against uh, uh, an hostis, a public enemy. Eh? The same in, in the Procestius or in the Provinci, uh, uh, Provincis Consularibus. 
uh, quiesc uh, hostis or in Philippics, the, this is hostis and it is a, a, a just war. No? For Kero, uh, this was absolutely clear. No? So uh, the idea of a bellum civile, a justum bellum, no? uh, against this uh, stasis or this enfilia, this war uh, between uh, relatives, between uh, kings. No? Okay, so uh, I'm finishing now, uh, just two words uh, to conclude. Uh, along the 20th century, it became widely believed that the civil war between Caesar and Pompey was nothing more than a struggle between dignitates, that is a confrontation for power, for leadership between ambitious politicians who were not prepared to compromise. This is not what uh, I, I believe or what we have found today, the theoretical frame that uh, sustained or supported this war was far more complex than that. It cannot be reduced to the concept of dignitas. And we also have good first account, account of the experience of the civil war in the writings of Cicero. This experience of the, of the civil war was much more complex, as I said, than just uh, simple uh, question of dignitas, which may perhaps uh, be enough for Caesar or for Pompey, but it was not the main concern for people such as Caelius or Asinius Polio or Cicero. And uh, I would say that the Roman paradigm was not the only one that uh, was uh, then in the late Republic was also another one whose origin may be Greek, huh? but it was also, uh, we can also find it in, in works such as uh, Salus. Um, there is some doubts uh, about Caesar and this is the reason why it, uh, I have, try, I have uh, deleted huh? uh, the, the word in the, in the, in the slide. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much. I'm top sharing the okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much to you. Thank you very much, Pedro, for this very, very, very interesting uh, presentation. Well, uh, there, there are a lot, a lot, lot of ideas, a lot of the, uh, aspects to think about. Uh, I think, I suppose, I hope there will be uh, plenty of, of uh, questions uh, for uh, thanks to your stimulating. Uh, discourse. Well, um, we are used to uh, used to say in the chat room if there are any questions or um, to, just to manifest your uh, intention to ask a question. So please, uh, are there any observation? Uh, Thank you. Wait, while you are thinking, I uh, may I ask you. Um, Okay, Emilio, just a, just a, just a minute. Uh, may I ask you a very, very short, very, very minor aspect. Uh, when you have quoted, you cited uh, the Nazica, the problem of the statute uh, of Nazica. Well, uh, what do you think to compare this, uh, the problem of the missing statue uh, with the building activity of uh, Lucius Opimius? Uh, when, when Lucius Opimius uh, killed Gaius Gracchus, he, he, he prefer not to have a personal um, honor, uh, personal sta um, statue, but uh, he, he built a temple of the, to the Concordia. So he was able to hide his personal uh, approach uh, with uh, pretending to be uh, the spokesman of the Senate. Which can be considered I, well. I think we can. It, it can be this, this, this attitude can be considered like as a precedent for uh, Caesar and uh, Octavian building activity, with the political use of uh, Caesar and Octavian building activity after a civil war. What do you mm -hmm. think about this? Uh, well, I, I think that Concordia is a, a, a catchword of the optimates, uh, very clear in Sulla's time, you know, this, this Pax Concordia slogan or catchword. And uh, it is also clear in, in Cicero. 
And of course, uh, this is a very good example, no? the Temple of Concordia by, by Opinius, by Opinius after killing the Tiberius uh, Gracchus and uh, with this uh, Caius Gracchus and with this um, graffiti, you know, there the, uh, was something that the Discord have made or have built a temple to Concord, no? Because it, yeah. it, it is clear, no? That, and this is something that I didn't mention in the, but it, it is also important. So uh, thank you for having <laughs> reminded me of this. Uh, from the Optimates, this is the Concordia, this is the normal situation in Rome. That is, uh, it can be altered or can be uh, a turmoil or problems, but it, these are the, the exception. No? Uh, and with the killing, uh, the Concordia has been restored to Rome, has been reinstalled in, in Rome. Mm -hmm. While from the uh, popularist point of view, the discordia uh, can be a good thing also, huh? even if Solus uh, looks at it or considers it uh, not a, a vice, not a very good thing. Uh, we have some uh, uh, some texts or some uh, phrases that uh, mean that uh, this discordia is something that has uh, helped the Romans uh, city to go further, to move further, no? to move forward. No? Oh, okay. um, for example, the Patricios, Patricians and Plebeians, this discord was help was helpful for the uh, for, was for, for the good, no? so to, to speak. So I, I would say that this is uh, this is something that the, um, also is in, uh, in, uh, belongs to this two paradigm, no? the one of the optimates with the Concordia and the other one of the Popularis where Discordia is perhaps the natural situation, I would say. Okay, that's a, okay. thank you very much. Okay, we have a question from Emilio Zucchetti. Sorry for letting you wait, <laughs> making you wait. Okay, no worries, thank you very much. And thank you very much, Pedro, for your talk and for the many inputs. So uh, what you talked about is something that is really close to my interests. So I'm very excited. Uh, I would start by subscribing to, to your views uh, against the Ralph Laub's reading as Dignitatis Contentio. Uh, because that's a narrow view just on the elites. Although Dignitas plays a major role in the arguments, I think, of legitimization that both the leaders used in different moments in addressing the crowd, uh, the people, the soldiers, to different degrees, really, according to the discursive situation in which one, uh, the leader was. So, Following on this note, uh, I would start by, by saying that uh, I feel the need to overcome uh, optimates populares divide. And I feel the need to overcome the binarism at all levels. So this might make me sound more deridian than I would like to be, but uh, the whole thing is about, you know, overcoming the binary in our analysis and go to the discursive. I find particular signif um, particularly interesting that you used uh, when you analyze the rem publica vindicare and in libertatem and, and the populum rem populum. Uh, there, the binary, I think it, it's a bit forced because it doesn't consider what libertas means in a, give <clears throat> in a given context. So there's no a popularis and an optimatis fixed meaning of libertas, but libertas as any other significant moves in meaning in the con discursive construction that it is in. Mm -hmm. In this way, I think it might be problematic to find a pure popularis meaning of libertas and a pure popularis meaning of uh, Liber uh, optimatis, sorry. But the same is true for, for many of the topics, I really think. I mean, statues and conflicting memories. Do we really have a Senate and a people memory, like this simple and this straightforward? Do we really have these two blocks opposing each other? 
I mean, the memories in the, the statues in the memory, satira, uh, um, fills the space. Uh, and the same is true for the final consideration, I think. So the Agamben Loro on one side, while I, I can totally see why you constructed it in this way, uh, we lose much outside this divide because for instance, the problem of kinship is also in the Roman narrative of civil war. It's, it's basic in, you know, Romulus and Remus and, and, and all the foundational charter myths really of the cities. Uh, in Agamben, we have the opposite as well in state of exception It's a totally different theory and it's based on Nissen instead of Loro and it, the outcome is different. So my question would really be, what do we gain according to you by setting these binarism between the Agamben, Loro and uh, interpretation and the Armitage interpretation? What is the pros and what are the cons? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's very interesting. I would say just uh, for, for the beginning uh, that uh, something that is important about the idea of libertas or freedom uh, that I don't think that there is uh, an idea, a popularist idea of freedom and a different optimate idea of freedom. In this particular point, I subscribe uh, Valentina Arena's analysis on the uh, libertas as non-domination. Uh, uh, there is a common ground uh, of libertas, which is different is what is the, the the thing to which this is applied, uh, uh, even if we think that libertas is the same, the, the idea, the concept of libertas is the same, on the one side of the picture we have the libertas senatus, on the other hand, on the other side of the picture we have the libertas populi. It's the same libertas, no, non domination, but it is not the same to say I'm fighting for the freedom of the people uh, as I am fighting for the freedom of the senate. Uh, even if freedom as a concept, uh, we may share uh, both both sides of the of the of the picture. Uh, my second point is uh, uh, maybe I would I would agree with you uh, on this idea that the, uh, the this binary uh, thing may be too. Uh, simplistic or too uh, a bit reductionist, if, we, if you want to say that. Uh, it has one advantage, it goes uh, beyond the ideological monotony. Huh? So um, if we want to move huh, uh, towards a more complex picture of the Roman Republic, perhaps uh, this is something that we can uh, we can achieve by in this way, no? saying well, we have different uh, at least two, no? maybe more, but at least two conflicting ideas. I know, obviously, I know that uh, populares and optimates is a very contentious issue, and it is uh, very difficult to pin them down, so to say, no, what, what uh, and to to really. Mm, uh, being able to to provide a definition, huh? uh, Valentina Arena to keep the, the to uh, mention her uh, again. Uh, she uh, spoke about uh, ideological families. Huh? I think huh? uh, even if there were other uh, ideas uh, circulating in late Republican Rome, it is important to be aware that these ideas at least uh, were circulating. Even if we have Romulus and Remo, uh, we have uh, Cicero, uh, Cicero. Uh, and Cicero was saying all this about civil war. This was his um, narrative, his um, idea, his construction of a civil war. And we have it and we, we should uh, at least uh, take it into account because it is very, uh, complex uh, and uh, I think that we, we can do better than uh, simply uh, for, uh, forget or dismiss no? his, his, um, uh, what he has to say, no? what Cicero has to say. 
Thank you. Well, yeah, I'm not. I'm not gonna monopolize the discussion. We'll have plenty of of times. To, okay. To yeah. Uh, sure. Uh, the the other problem is that it, it we we risk being monopolized by him. We risk centering our conception of the Roman world all around Cicero, and I think that's a risk as much as dismissing him. Well, I I would I would, I would disagree. I mean, it is uh, a risk, eh? but I think that. Uh, with a, uh, in the view of we want to avoid that risk, in some sense we have uh, forgotten about Cicero in many ways. Perhaps because Simon so much dislike him, hmm? uh, his account of the Roman Civil War huh, is not so very common in uh, modern scholarship because. Obviously, no, I, I agree. No, uh, it, uh, we, ha we risk uh, having a one side, uh, of, uh, having one side uh, picture. No? But uh, I think that we have fallen uh, in the other uh, side, no? that this, uh, very, uh, this um, very English uh, saying no? that we have uh, throw the, the baby with the baby with the bath, uh, well, with the, but uh, with the water was, I, I, I don't remember, no? Well, okay, yes, I, I, I understand the, the problem very well because uh, uh, I think the, what well, about the, the problem of uh, bipolar, bipolarizing, I think also we have another problem to understand. Uh, optimates is very, very difficult to define uh, rather than populares. Populares, well, maybe, but optimates is very, I, I, it's very hard to find an ideological uh, patterns, um, com, a common ideology to such so-called optimates. Well, I see in the chat room, we have plenty of questions about populares and optimates. And we also, we have also a question from Consuelo Martino. Is, on the, is, is this on the same topics? Uh, it's very close to this queue on Cicero, so okay. I think it's pretty appropriate. So, yes, I thought it was on, a yeah. battle question, but indeed, we just closed the first one on this. Um, so, um, again, it might not be very close to the main topic of your talk. By the way, that was very amazing. Thank you. Uh, but I was wondering, you noticed at the beginning how Nepos commented on the fact that Cicero's letters are considered somehow a form of history. So. My question is, I'm a big fan of Cicero, so I agree with you. We uh, uh, don't uh, look at him too much uh, as we should for the Civil War. So my question would be more related to the fact that, do you think that Cicero's works actually were considered a source for Civil War in antiquity and in the empire by imperial historiography or other works? I'm thinking, for example, at Lucan compar Lucan's comparison to between Caesar and Hannibal at the beginning of the first book and Cicero's all same comparison in uh, Atticus 7, uh, 11th letter in the book 7. So uh, what's your idea about this? I don't feel competent at all to answer that question uh, because I haven't done any research on that. I I would uh, agree with you, eh? I but I think that you know uh, more than than me about that. Uh, I I would say that uh, Nepos set uh, the the path uh, in a sense. No? The, it was the, the, the idea that if you want to find a, a history of the civil war, you can uh, read uh, these, uh, these books and uh, taking into account the high reputation no, that Cicero uh, enjoyed from Augustus uh, onwards, no? uh, even if Augustus was responsible for his death, uh, it is, I think, very likely that uh, they, uh, because uh, obviously enough, there were many other books. No, the, uh, the, there has a, a very interesting guesstimate uh, about how many books uh, uh, on civil wars was written in in Roman times. No, I think it was four hundred Roman volumes or some or so. No? Uh, so it is uh, difficult to be to be sure, but I, I, I would say yes, yeah, definitely. Thank you. Uh, I agree, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have a comment from Uwe. Uwe Walter. 
I just try to write down that that I don't think uh, um, Cicero is a very good, very good um, interpretator of these uh, of the Civil War constellation, since uh, he perhaps induced by his by his philosophical training uh, is always uh, trying to to give Roman, Roman, Roman politics a kind of, of consistency, um, which, which is not part of the tradition of aristocratic policy in Rome, where making deals, being neutral, and uh, having different grades of, of, uh, of, of political will uh, is, is part of the of the tradition, and uh, Cicero, by his very autocratic, uh, be with me or be with me or be uh, be against me, um, I think uh, goes away from the political tradition in Roman aristocratic policy. Yes, uh, well, uh, my my. My idea uh, is that uh, if we use Cicero's letters, we avoid this consistency. What we have in, in Cicero's letters to Atticus or to his friends is his agonizings, his doubts, his, uh, the, the, the concerns of someone who is really living the civil war from the point of view of an aristocrat, obviously enough. We cannot reconstruct. We don't have sources about what the common people thought or what their feelings were. No? But we do have uh, Cicero's letters and in up to a point, uh, they match with what Calibas says about the civil war in modern uh, Greece. No? This idea of the connections of the, uh, with the ideological points also take, being taken into, into account. No? But uh, I think that here we have, as, as you know, we have Cicero uh, in all his uh, very soul with, with no, um, it, his rhetorical training was there, obviously enough. No? He, he was uh, trained as a, as a rhetor, no? but he, uh, he uh, was changing his opinion almost uh, by the day. No? And so uh, I think that uh, by this, uh, we can have uh, something less uh, one-sided. This does not mean, obviously not, that we should uh, use Cicero only. Hmm? And this is why I ended with Solust. Huh? We should grow the picture as much as we can, hmm? but uh, we don't have any so contemporary, so so vivid, no, as this uh, Cicero letter. If we want to retrieve the experience of civil war. Okay, um, Federica Lazzarini, would you like to comment on your observation? Uh, I wasn't really uh, looking to comment. It was just okay. to uh, say so that. I mean, I, uh, I think people in the chat are not necessarily saying different things in, in that it's uh, on the one hand, uh, of course, yes, there are two sides in a civil war. And uh, I, I think at the end of the day, it's a matter of where, how do we connect the dots? And I think, uh, I mean, we can acknowledge the same facts and the same the, the, the fact that there was a certain divide and there were two sides contending with one another but then the picture that we um that we draw the, the dots that we connect and the lines that we draw that is up to the individual and i think um pedro lopez has uh, shown really convincingly that yes different authors might have drawn different pictures and connected the dots differently even though the dots were the same so as in on the one hand we have the facts but then on the, on the other hand we have how did people present those facts? So I, um, yeah, I didn't really want to add anything to what was being said in the chat. Yeah, thank you. I would say, I would add to, uh, to this problem that it is a problem of the binary uh, focus, no? as uh, Cicchetti said, Emilio. Uh, even if it's, it's true in the, in the Roman Republic, 
I would think that in a civil war, things tend to be very one-sided. No, you take one side or the other. No? So uh, it is a very contentious issue and probably th uh, things or things that were not so important and that were from details and we may disagree on this point, but in a civil war, you have to take sides. You don't uh, really, these subtleties are a little bit cast aside, no? Because of, uh, because of this, uh, I, I would not uh, hide from the fact that I am up to a point uh, under the influence of the Spanish Civil War. And if you read what they were saying, uh, it is very clear no, how uh, these things, uh, they were talking about probably the same ideas, but from confronting perspectives, no? the opposite sides. No? And things tend to be very, at, at the end, very uh, clear cut. No? You're for or against, this is the Ciceronian uh, uh, evidence, no? uh, as uh, Walter said before, no? for or against me. No? Okay, uh, well, uh, okay, that's a very interesting stimulating perspective. Eh? Uh, we have also other questions which are different from this aspect um, from uh, Cristina, Rosilio Lopez, and then Federico Santangelo. So, Cristina. Ok, thanks. Um, perdona, Pedro, no puedo enchufar la cámara ahora, así que no me vas a poder ver. No worries. Um, uh, just, just two things. One, I really agree with you that Cicero's letters offer a very exceptional perspective, especially in the sense that they were not rewritten um, afterwards. They were selected, but not uh, rewritten afterwards. And, and as you were saying, he's not the, one, the only one who is agonizing over his uh, choice of, of sides. And I think that gives us a glimpse of how difficult as the choice it was for many of them. Servius Sulpicius Rufus did the same. He traveled 200 kilometers and he was sick just to talk about that with Cicero because he couldn't, I, he couldn't I, I, neither uh, choose a side. Like he was in doubt about that. And um, so I wanted to ask you as well about uh, Caelius Rufus' comment at, uh, at the beginning of, or before the war, in when he talks about causa. And I think very interesting that he doesn't shy away of using that uh, concept. And I was wondering whether you have tracked uh, if there are other instances of this kind of, uh, this concept causa used around, around the civil war. Yes, uh, we may think that he was a little bit impudent, no? When he says, "Well, this is my causa, but uh, I I choose the the, the other uh, the other side." Uh, it's not a very common uh, word in this sense in in contemporary uh, sources. I mean, in the late Republic, uh, I, but I I think that I have tracked it in in Cicero's also. Uh, I I may give you the the. Um, the sources uh, later in Cicero in in I don't remember maybe three or four instances in this uh, is uh, fighting for for a cause no this causa is more or less the, the modern uh, idea that this is the the, the causa no of, uh, I would say okay Federico. We cannot hear you. You probably cannot hear me, yeah. Uh, so sorry, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Okay, sure. thank you. Well, thank you very much, Pedro. I, I wonder whether I could take you towards the beginning of your, of your paper. I, I, I found your decision to start with polio extremely stimulating um, mm -hmm. because clearly it's such, such a big part of, the, uh, of any attempt to try and write a story of the civil wars. So I was wondering whether, uh, well, I could ask you two questions. Uh, a, a rather narrow one and, and uh, a, a rather wider one. Uh, in that beautiful uh, letter to Cicero, uh, Fam 10.31, uh, I think, when he talks about the fact that he's an optimus and that you know, dilexi summa cum pietate et fide, right? Pietas and fides are catchwords, right? In the Simian sense of the word. Would you place them on, a, on an optimate or on a popularist spectrum? Or would you, as I would tend to do, reject that, uh, try and uh, that attempt to try and pigeonhole uh, catchwords into into either camp? But 
I was wondering whether you have any further thoughts on why he's using and how he's using those two words in that specific text. But more broadly, I was wondering, I mean, you, you quoted that rather brilliant set of doxography at the beginning on, on polio and, and his role in the tradition of the civil wars. And I wonder whether you could expand a bit more on, on, on your take on, um, on polio's place in the history uh, or in the, in, in the historiography, in the historical tradition on the civil wars, to what extent you should, uh, um, well, uh, buy his account uh, or indeed take his sensitivities uh, seriously. Thank you. Well, uh, in a sense, this uh, has uh, come to either you are for Cicero or you are for polio, no? Uh, and this is uh, uh, risky, you know? Uh, and, and sometimes I, I feel like that. Eh? I, I'm, I'm for Cicero, so I... I don't I'm, go for yeah. binaries. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I would say that uh, my, my problem with, with polio is, as I said before, that we don't have his words. Even if we have a translation uh, of, of, of that, well, apart from the letters to Cicero, obviously, which are all important, uh, uh, we don't have uh, his, uh, his words. And sometimes when we have, uh, when we can see you know, this uh, Greek version, to my feeling, uh, it's not very, uh, I mean, there is much, very much uh, late uh, first century AD or Cassius Leo, very much severian, sever, uh, late uh, to century uh, AD in the picture. No? And, and it distorted uh, um, somehow. So I would um, take uh, polio uh, into the picture, but with less confidence than either Syme or, or Brandt, yeah? with less, which is easier because they were, they had so much confidence in, in him. And uh, about Pietas and Fides, um, that's a tricky question. I would say that Fides, uh, the easiest explanation is that his personal loyalty, you know, that is a very uh, common, both uh, broad Roman term, no? I, I, uh, because uh, Asinius Polo is saying that uh, Caesar has taken him into his amicitia, even if he's a new, uh, he has not known him for a long time. No, he's new in his circle of friends, so to speak, and he has to, he has a, a duty to correspond to this um, offering of amicitia with this uh, fides, no, to to him, no, and this is something uh, he's, I think he's invoking or he's uh, stating that his loyalty to his friend uh, compel him to follow. No? This is the point that I, I wanted to make. In, in Calibas, the, in Satis Calibas, the logic of uh, violence, the idea that you have to follow the leader eh, is all important, uh, is one of the main reasons why you take a side. No? Because this is, even if it's not my ideology or all, this is my leader. I am, I am with Franco in Spain, no, or, or whatever. No, this is so, uh, so important. And here uh, in in this letter, I think that we can find that precisely, you know, very precisely. This is his loyalty to to Paul, which is a, an excuse or a reason that many others gave uh, for uh, after the the war when they wanted to make amends to Caesar. Uh, they said, well, uh, I chose the wrong side, but they were my friends, or I have a personal loyalty to, to them. Thank you. Well, uh, did, I, did, I have, um, did I forget um, any, anyone? Okay, other, other questions? Okay. There are well, there are plenty, plenty things to about. Uh, we can think. Uh, your your, um, your presentation gave us a lot of ideas, uh, <laughs> lots of categories uh, on which we have to dwell for a long time. Well, I think we can stop here um, for this evening. So thank you very much, Pedro. And thank you very much to you, every, to everybody, for uh, the very, very huge and uh, interesting uh, discussion we have with now. So, um, thank you very much. You can stop, stop, uh, uh, you can stop the recording, yeah? I suppose I we can, yes. Yes. Okay.
Um, I, I guess just thank you very can much. remember the next next week. Uh...